Hey, hey, this is Teresa Matsura, and you're listening to Uncanny Japan. Here it is October, almost Halloween. While it's celebrated slightly differently here in Japan, I was still raised in the States, and I retain that special spooky hidden closet in my heart for the thrills and chills that come with the month of October. Next week, Richard and I have something very special and potentially terrifying planned. But for today, I want to do something, well, equally special and potentially terrifying, but in a different way. Today, I'm going to read to you one of my stories from The Carp Faced Boy and Other Tales. I reread it recently, and I fell in love with it all over again, which sounds vain, but I'll tell you why in a minute. First, before I start, while I don't think this piece is too over the top, It is horror, and it might be a little much. There is a list of trigger warnings on the website for this episode if you want to look at those and see what you think. Would you like to explore the stranger, more obscure corners of Japanese culture? Dig a little deeper into superstitions, curious customs, and all those mysterious creatures that inhabit the land? If so, then this is the podcast for you. Uncanny Japan is where I, author Teresa Matsura, share all the fascinating tidbits I unearth while doing research for my writing. From the bizarre to the ghastly and everything in between. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, hey. Okay, at the moment, I'm reading all of my stories from The Carp-Faced Boy because, yes, you've asked for it, and we're recording an audiobook of the collection to be released by, everyone cross your fingers, the end of this year. But we'll see. We're very busy. We have other things going on too, but we would like to get this done. So anyway, while I was doing that, I reread this one story that I wrote in 2015, Now, that's a full five years before this whole pandemic business started. I'm not saying I'm in the same league as Nostradamus. I mean, I've always been infatuated with mass diseases and how they affect different cultures. So, yeah, the Black Plague, smallpox, I feel you. But on rereading this story, I got goosebumps and I fell in love with it all over again for a new reason. Remember, this is five years before any COVID-19 anything. But the antagonists in the story could very well be a shoe in for, well, let me read it and you tell me what you think. It's, to me, it's quite spooky. So yeah, let me know. Social media, email, discord. I don't care. Just tell me what you think. I'm very curious to see if anyone else feels that this is a wildly prophetic piece. The story is called Go Away Monkey and it is chock full of old Japanese cultural richness, and we're talking about a highly infectious disease, in this case smallpox, a grifter, and a monkey. If you've listened to episode four on monkeys, you'll get even more of the references, I bet. I even added a very dark and twisted spin on Alice in Wonderland to the tale to boot which is a coincidence because I just finished reading Through the Looking Glass over on the Soothing Stories podcast. Go away, monkey. A monkey, a monkey! A handful of broken children cried as they stumbled along the raised embankment, heading toward the town's center. A monkey? Okapa, Trapped beneath the weight of the vile man, Fuhaku, puzzled at why they were so excited. The animals weren't uncommon. They snuck into town all the time in search of food or to misbehave. What was so special about this particular monkey? Fuhaku groaned and another group of townspeople wheezing and dragging withered limbs scuttled by. Not one of them, not the children or the adults, noticed Okapa and the noisy man struggling in the freshly cut, still wet rice field below. Why didn't he finish already? Okapa squirmed and bucked under the man's sweaty weight. But he only chuckled, 
got a better grip on her long hair and pinned her once more to the muddy ground. She couldn't leave yet. Timing. Sometimes she thought it was her luck that kept her alive this long. Other times, her timing. While she waited, Okapa saved her strength and considered the depth of the glaze-blue autumn sky above. The way the townspeople suddenly shuffled around today, more animated, more aware, spurred a nervous scratching under her ribs. And now a monkey, she thought. A monkey. Just then in the sky beyond the man's ramming shoulder, a flock of cranes flew, parting clouds that immediately knitted back together in the bird's wake. Ichi, Ni, San. The girl counted three more than last year. Fledglings. A resolve tightened in her gut. Something to look forward to. Tomorrow she'd head out early and spend all day at the marshlands watching the animals feed and play. Such a pretty, pretty girl. Fuhaku nuzzled her neck and let go of her hair. His stench. Raw and boar-like, clung to the back of her throat. She guessed it would stay there all day long. Gradually, his weight increased as it always did after he exhausted himself. Without the piggish grunting in her ear, she could hear it now, in the distance, a jangle of bells echoing off the surrounding foothills. That's when she understood what the clamor was about. Such a pretty... Fuhaku's breath was hot and reeked of vinegar. His voice was growing sleepy. Such a pretty, pretty girl. Now it was time to go. Do you hear that? Okapa kicked herself out from under the large man. Squelching through the mud, she got far enough away so that he couldn't grab her and yank her back. That had happened far too many times. She'd learned her lesson. The faraway bells were getting closer. A stranger is here, she said. It sounds like it might be a sarumawashi, a monkey show. Fuhaku sat up, legs splayed. His brow furrowed as he considered her words. A second later, his slack face brightened and he leapt to his feet. A monkey. He thrust two fingers into the obi that had loosened after slipping from his meaty belly up to his coward's chest. He withdrew a small gray river stone. Kore kureru, he said. Take this. He tossed the rock at her feet and then, after giving her a playful kick in the side, scrambled up the bank to join the quickly growing procession. Monster, Okapa thought, standing. Pox-infested, plithy-brained, wretched monster. She slapped at her work kimono, attempting to knock off as much of the clinging mud as she could. One day, she'd own a beautiful garment, something that wouldn't scratch her skin, something as soft as the tufts of crane down she collected from the fields after the birds frolicked. She believed the tufts held magic and gathered the fuzzy down, keeping it hidden at all times in the long, dangling sleeves of her robe. Okapa plucked the smooth stone from the ground and placed it on her tongue. She rolled it around in her mouth. The hardness softened as it clicked against her teeth. She held it in the hollow of her cheek and counted. Ichi, ni, san. This was her magic. She wished again that it wasn't so tiny. Practically useless. After checking to make sure she hadn't lost her sickle, she slipped her hand to the hemp pouch on her hip and withdrew a handful of fragrant, freshly harvested shepherd's purse. She spat the stone, now a soft and sticky candy, into her palm and covered it with the frilly leaves. She then tucked the treat into the unstitched opening on her collar and carefully worked it down. It was a shame how many sweetmeats she lost to street urchins and thieves and otherwise friendly neighbors. She swore everyone here could smell food, no matter how well hidden. Okapa climbed from the field and folded into line behind the ghetto maker's wife. 
there on the woman's back, secured by a long ombu himo made of dirty gauze, were her twin daughters. Okapa tried not to notice how their dark, lifeless heads bounced in perfect time to the woman's steps, or how the woman still sang them lullabies and shushed them, despite the fact they hadn't made a sound in over a week. As the throng neared the center of town, they fanned out. They gathered close, but didn't cross the line the stranger was etching into the ground with his belled walking stick. He was drawing a giant circle. In the middle of that circle stood the crumbling stones of the town's only well. His stage, Okapa thought. All around the circle's outside edge there grew the stranger's audience. An audience trembling and wheezing, hundreds of reedy legs, balancing bellies, bursting with disease. It was terrible, but in the mass of dying flesh and heartbeats, Okapa noticed their eyes, in every single one mucus-filled or vacant, shown something she hadn't seen since the unfortunate wind blew in and ruined them all. It almost looked like hope. The stranger finished his work and stood hands on hips to survey the crowd. Okapa marveled at the man under indigo robes of soiled but finely woven linen, moved a body not crooked, not exhausted from his travels, not starving. In the rise of his shoulders and the turn of his waist, there lurked power and certainty. It made Okapa nervous. She realized in her own body she could no longer distinguish hope from fear. Before she could fall under his spell, though, her attention flitted. There, next to the well, was a pile of the man's bags, and on top of that crouched the monkey. It wore the same robe and bowl-shaped pilgrim's hat as its master, even donned matching woven sandals that laced up its twig-like legs. So tiny, Okapa thought, it was smaller than any of the creatures that descended from the mountains when hungry or mad. Was it a baby? but the face was different than the mountain monkeys, too. The stranger, seemingly satisfied with the number of people gathered, gave a hard yank on the long braided rope that ran from his belt to the monkey's ankle. Okapa cringed at the innervated squeak the animal made in reply to the order. She understood that reaction. She knew it well. The monkey jumped and scurried to the stranger's side. It climbed up his robes and took a seat on his shoulder. Come, merchant, farmer, father and son. The stranger paced the circle. He thumped the bottom of his staff on the ground, jingling the cluster of metal rings on top. Come, mother, daughter, come, everyone. Just then across the crowd, Okapa spotted her grandfather, his gaze skipping from person to person but oblivious to the spectacle by the well. He looked lost and afraid, and if she knew him as well as she thought she did, he looked like he was about to panic. Okapa made her way over. Oji-chan, she said, touching his shoulder, uncertain if it was him today or not. Her grandfather turned. His unfocused eyes cleared when he saw her. Look at you. The old man threw both arms into the air and brought them down again so that he could rub his hands together in a way that always made Okapa think of an elderly, sideways-leaning, praying mantis. Shouldn't you be resting? she asked. How do you feel? Oh, I'm just fine, as fine as yesterday and the day after that, he said, and smiled his almost toothless grin. Are you hungry? Okapa pressed her hand over the candy hidden in her robe. She was relieved that her grandfather wasn't completely cloudy today, and she wanted to reward him when he could remember, at least for the moment. He took in her action, cut his eyes at the jostling, greedy crowd, and shook his head. No, no, not at all. I just ate a big meal of salmon and pheasant and black beans. He slapped an imaginary belly and pretended to burp into his fist. 
Old Coppa felt terrible that he had to lie, but smiled at the dramatic reply. But look at you. The old man pulled away to examine once more her clothes. Did you fall again? Okapa laughed and looked down at her filthy work kimono. Slipped on one of those jumbo tanishi snails. The pink ones? She nodded. Those are the nastiest. They are, aren't they? She took his elbow and together they weaved their way through the suffering mass, apologizing as they went. The sitting and crouching townspeople scowled and scooted aside. Old Lady Tora spat at Okapa's feet, while her husband slid a calloused hand up her kimono and squeezed her calf. Okapa pulled away and steered her grandfather to a place right behind the inscribed line, where they took a seat. I, I don't understand what's happening here, Hiroji chan asked, suddenly aware of his surroundings. Okapa's smile felt weak on her lips. She remembered not five years ago when her grandfather had been a respected healer. He taught her everything she knew about wild grasses and roots. When the bad wind blew in, it was her Ojijan who left the town and traveled to faraway cities in order to bring back new medicines. But none of them worked. The seeds of disease grabbed hold until even her grandfather, so wise and knowledgeable, lost his confidence. So she watched helplessly as her last surviving family member crumbled. It wasn't the god of pox that wrecked him. It was something almost more insidious. It was something that crept in and over time weakened his mind. Now she hardly recognized the man she looked up to for so many years. Watch, Okapa said and pointed to the stranger and his animal. She tried not to remember what happened to the last stranger who had wandered into their town uninvited. My name is Hanshiro of Edo, and this tiny beast is Fukumimi. The stranger crooned. With a flourish, he grabbed the monkey from his shoulder and tossed it into the air. Fukumimi landed in the dirt. Two quick claps of Hanshiro's hands and the animal stood at attention, teeth bared one furry shoulder peeking out from its skewed robe. Okapa wished she could pet it. She wondered if it would bite. She wondered if it was afraid. Hungry, maybe. Hanshiro mimicked the pose, standing straight, hands flat by his sides, a gruff clearing of his throat, and the two bowed in unison. The townspeople clapped and whistled, wheezed and coughed. The anticipation of the show had enlivened them. It really had been a long time since they had seen an outsider. Over a year or two, no traveler dared come near their little corner of the world. Fukumimi and I have journeyed from the great city of Edo to the holy Mount Hie, where the Inlaku Temple resides. Hanshiro made a sweeping motion toward the places he was talking about. Okapa thought about the cranes earlier and remembered her talks with her grandfather when his mind was whole. She recalled the maps of faraway cities he'd drawn for her with words. He used the hills and mountains she knew as guideposts. To the west lay Kyoto, in the east past the faraway snowy top of Mount Fuji, was Edo. The strange traveler Hanshiro was wrong. Mount Hiei was in the opposite direction. During our stay at Inlakuji, we were fortunate enough to encounter a mountain Tengu who imparted on us the secrets of an auspicious ritual. He continued, We are now on our way back to the magnificent Edo, but we thought we would share our good fortune with the towns and villages along the way. The people cheered again. Okapa became aware that the growing hysteria smelled of burning honey and rotting fish. She brought her hands to her nose, fingers still fragrant from this morning's collected herbs, and took a deep breath. Tomorrow she'd go to the marshlands and watch the cranes play. It was a soothing thought. Something bumped hard into Okapa's shoulder and she turned to see the town's carp-faced boy. 
The dreadful, stunted thing was pointing at the monkey and bouncing on the balls of his feet. His bug eyes blinked, mouth popping open and closed, open and closed. She had never seen him so happy before. She smiled back and moved to pat him on the head. But before she could touch the child, two arms grabbed him away. His mother glowered at Okapa and hissed before disappearing with him into the crowd. What lovely children you have here, Hanshiro said. He took three long strides to the edge of the homemade stage. He ruffled a small boy's thinning hair. The monkey gallop popped behind him, careful not to earn another tug on the leash. Okapa wondered why the man kept the rope looped and tucked so short at his waist. What was he afraid of? Are they very smart children? Hanshiro asked. It was an inquiry that sounded like an accusation. The people fidgeted and looked around. Of course they are. Hanshiro answered his own question and lightened the mood again. Here's how I know. He held up a finger to indicate a grand idea. I'll ask them a question and I'll prove it to you. He strode back to the well, where he could be seen better by the surrounding audience. Two snaps of his fingers and Fukumimi scampered back onto the pile of belongings the stranger had lugged in on his back. What do we have here? He motioned to the animal at his side. Fukumimi kikikied. His monkey shoulders stiffened and rose to his ears. He showed his teeth again, but this time the action resembled a smile. Saru, the children cried. Saru. Hanshiro affirmed. He waved his hands and the monkey gracefully tumbled off the boxes and did a series of somersaults before returning to his perch. The children hooted and giggled. Okapa thought how sweet and clever the animal was and again had the urge to run up and pet it. A monkey, yes, a saru. And what other meaning does saru have? Before any of the children could answer, Okapa's grandfather shouted, Go away! Okapa was shocked at his rudeness, but the stranger didn't look offended. Instead, he sauntered over to where she and her grandfather sat. Oh. Hanjiro said, the youngest heart in the group I see. Okapa's ojicham beamed and began scratching nervously on his forearm. It was a habit she'd noticed he picked up several days ago. Tomorrow when she was out at the marshes, she'd find him some fish wart and make him a skin tincture. Okapa ignored the banter between the two men and instead tried to get Fukumimi's attention. But the animal was shy and kept hidden behind his master's legs. Yes, then, Saru also means to go away. Hanshiro boomed and strode back toward the center of his stage. That was when Okapa noticed the blood welling up on her grandfather's arm, the flesh scratched away like the thin, delicate skin of a fish that had been grilled too long. She gasped and seized his hand to stop him from causing any more damage. She looked around for someone to help, but the others remained riveted to the stranger and his monkey. The few people who did witness the old man's injury and Okapa's distress all avoided eye contact. She'd have to do this, too, alone. After finding the cleanest spot on her obi, Okapa used the sickle at her hip to cut off a bandage. She took a couple pinches from the precious crane down hidden in her dangling sleeve and pressed it into the wound. It was the only pure thing she owned, and maybe it was magic. She then wrapped his arm and tied it. We need to get you home, Okapa said. No, no. Her grandfather snatched his arm away. He had become mesmerized by the stranger and his pet. Go away, Hanshiro shouted. Everyone wants something to go away. Maybe it's the shriveled, insatiable claw of the poverty god, Bimbo Gami. There it is lurking just over your doorstep, plucking away every good fortune before it enters your house. The man squatted and mimicked the miserable god everyone feared. Or perhaps it's something smaller, a festering tooth, or an ancestor spirit acting a foul. Hanshiro paused. 
maybe a bothersome mother-in-law. There was an eruption of laughter, and Okapa turned to watch the sea of black chortling holes, all of them expelling the last bit of air from their failing lungs, as they remembered the hilarity of what sometimes happened to bad mothers-in-law in their town. The seasons are changing. The tone of Hanshiro's voice was foreboding. I hear it gets rather dire in towns like this. The snow can grow deep and hunger torments with a renewed fury when it's winter. Three times he struck the ground with his walking stick. Each ni san. The metal hoops on top jangled and the sky overhead grayed. A chilly wind kicked up and sent ice crackling through Okapa's bones. The near constant coughing Okapa had grown used to soured to hacking and then retching. So this is my promise. Hanshiro began again. If any of you good people could spare something, anything, a clink of coin, a whalebone netsuke, even a tarnished kiseru pipe that you no longer have use for, I will grant you one wish. Hanshiro raised that long finger once more. But here's the difference. Instead of giving you something, I will take something away. I will remove from you the thing you wish most to be rid of. Was such a thing possible? Could he eliminate their suffering, their sickness? Okapa was about to change her opinion of the man when she glanced down and saw the heel of his sandaled foot firmly on the back of the monkey's head. He was keeping the animal's face pressed into the dirt, kowtowing, begging the town's good favor. Something vile and heavy bloomed in her chest. How could she have thought he was a good man? To accomplish such a feat, however, we must first transform this creature into the great god, Sarutahiko. For those of you who wish to watch the transformation, please do, but don't forget to fetch your currency. We will begin the trade as soon as the dressing ceremony is completed. Hanshiro motioned to the sky with his staff. It looks like the weather is growing foul. I think we should hurry. How about you? Hoarse whispers and slaps from wizened hands sent dozens of children flying from the mob. They went to retrieve some perceived valuable that might be worthy enough to exchange for a wish. Okapa watched the little ones scurry away. Were her neighbors really so desperate and blind that not a single one of them considered the imbalance of the stranger's deal? Now watch closely. Hanshiro removed his foot from the animal's head. He clapped his hands twice and Fukumimi, the monkey, stood at attention, its arms extended from its sides, its chin up. Sarutahiko is one of the seven great gods, Hanshiro explained. He knelt and stripped the animal of its traveling clothes. The monkey looked even smaller and more pitiful than before. Its eyes darted from side to side and Okapa was sure it was looking for a way to flee. Timing, she wanted to tell it. If it was patient, infinitely patient, there would come the perfect time for it to escape. Timing or luck. Okapa felt weary carrying these thoughts for so long, but she had to. It was the only thing that kept her sane when everyone around her lost hope. Look what happened to them. Sarutahiko is the symbol of strength and guidance. He clears the way, removes obstacles. Hanshiro continued. Let us say he is a god that embraces many roles. The stranger removed a boxwood comb from one of the lacquer boxes he retrieved from his bundles and ran it through Fukumimi's fur. The monkey remained in the same upright position throughout the lengthy ceremony even as a greasy chunk of fragrant ambergris was massaged into its temples and chest, even as a tin was upturned and tapped with a fingernail until it sprinkled powder over its feet. Okapa wondered how long it could endure the pose. 
when next came a pair of tall, single-toothed getta. The shoes were explained, prayed over, and finally strapped firmly to the animal's dusted feet. Fukumimi's legs trembled, but it didn't drop its arms or glance down. Okapa wanted the whole show to stop already. She looked away back at the ugly audience, wrapped and waiting for the magic to happen. The children had begun returning from their errands and were slipping their pathetic treasures into their parents' hands. When the last child found his seat on the ground, there was a sudden gasp and a flurry of hands pointed toward the well. Okapa turned in time to witness Hanshiro flourishing a garnet-colored silk kimono for all to see. Her breath swelled in her chest. She'd never seen anything so beautiful, not even in her most vivid dreams. It seemed to carry its own light in the fast, darkening sky. Hanshiro threaded the animal's arms through the weighty sleeves, adjusting the cloth on its shoulders, smoothing it as he went. An amber-colored obi was then wrapped and twisted into an elaborate knot at the small of the monkey's back. Hanshiro stood up and admired his work. Fukumimi looked resplendent, balancing on the tall getta shoes. Its arms were outstretched to fully display the intricate patterns of gold and black stitched into the shimmery red material. Okapa's chest ached at both the beauty and the sadness. Was she the only one who saw the animal's trembling, tired limbs and the length of rope still connecting its scarred foot to its master? As many of you might know, Sarutahiko is also an ancestor of the Tengu, the mountain goblin. Hanshiro opened the last box. It was because of my friend here that we were given audience to the great Tengu of Mount Hie. He produced a crimson mask and held it up for everyone to see. There was a simultaneous intake of breath. Thunder rumbled in the foothills. The air grew colder still. The storm the stranger had called was close. No one seemed to notice. You'll recognize the same long nose and ruddy face. Hanshiro pointed out. Okapa wasn't sure if it was the detail of the mask that caused the gathering to balk or the ghoulish expression it had. A deeply furrowed brow creased his forehead, while from its eyebrows and chin great shocks of stiff white hair flew like some unnatural beast. It looked alive, Okapa thought, more alive than even the people who surrounded her. By far the worst feature of the mask, though, was its mouth. Even from the distance, she could make out the yellow of two sharp fangs buried into the black-lipped grimace. It was an expression of absolute fury. Horrifying. What kind of god was this? I give you the great Sarutahiko. Hanshiro placed the mask over the monkey's face and tied it securely. He waited for the applause to cease before removing his sandogasa. Here we will accept your offerings. Hanshiro flipped the woven bamboo hat upside down so that it resembled a basket. He hugged it to his side with one arm. Shall we begin? To Kappa's surprise, Hanshiro then pulled the coiled leash free from his belt, giving the fettered animal the freedom of the entire length of rope. The man then snatched up his walking stick and began hitting it rhythmically on the ground. With each jolt, the cluster of rings on top sang out and more dark clouds rolled in. He started a slow chant. The words were nothing Okapa had ever heard before. Old Japanese or Chinese or maybe some long-dead language known only to the gods. Discordant. Mesmerizing. Wrong. Fukumimi, now Sarutahiko, stood in the center of the ring near the well, stately, no longer fidgeting or swaying under the weight of the outfit. Had a real transformation taken place? Okapa imagined the tiny frightened creature she had witnessed cowering behind its master's calves not ten minutes ago. But it had vanished and instead there donned in an awful mask and beautiful silks, breathed a god. 
Excitement mingled with fear shivered goosebumps across her skin. Could this traveling stranger really grant the town's wishes? And what would the town do if he couldn't? Saruta Hiko took his first step. Okapa held her breath. Sure, the creature would tumble off the precarious shoes and hurt himself. But he didn't. Instead, every time it brought the single tooth of Ageta down, the shoe seemed to bite into the earth and hold on. Lift, move, hover, stab. It circled the perimeter of the stage. At least 20 paces behind, Hanshiro followed. The droning incantation and the constant ringing of metal on metal growing until a cacophony filled the darkening sky and turned the townspeople mad with hope and the promise of release from their hell. A flash of skeletal lightning lit up the hills in the distance, a growl of thunder. Now it was the monkey who tethered the man, Okapa thought. The little god bowed its masked head once, and stepped straight into the voracious mob. Immediately, a tangle of arms, weeping flesh, stretched flower petal thin across splintering bones, shot out. But Saruta Hiko remained erect, composed, and continued its stoic march. The only emotion betraying him was the mask, as it sneered and ground its muscled jaws. Weren't gods supposed to be compassionate? Okapa waited anxiously as the two wove their way through the roiling mass. Her attention fell on Hanshiro, dutifully hypnotizing the people and collecting their worthless trinkets in his upturned hat. She caught a hint of a smile on his face. A smirk. It almost looked like he was appraising each item as it tumbled in. So that's what this was really about. Anger seethed in Okapa's chest. This man could not alleviate anyone's torment. He was a charlatan. It made her ache to witness what little effort it took to convince the utterly hopeless that their suffering wasn't in vain, that they were due their just reward. Happiness would be theirs again, but at a cost. These paltry tokens couldn't be enough. What else did the stranger want? Lift, move, hover, stab. Another step. The monkey turned again, and Okapa could have sworn she saw the fiery eyes behind the mask flicker with recognition as they met hers. The expression changed, and one corner of the frown pulled up into a half grin. She was overcome with the feeling that she knew this creature. Sarutahiko began its slow advance in her direction. Without thinking, Okapa ran two fingers up the hem of her robe and found the lump of candy hidden there earlier. As quickly as she could, she worked the treat through the rough material to the open seam, slipped it out, and cupped it in her palms. She glanced around, seeing if the others could smell it. She knew what they would do if they could. But it wasn't her neighbors that noticed her betrayal. It was her grandfather. Oji-chan sat cross-legged, not awed by the monkey god headed their way, but staring at her with lucid eyes. For years, this was their routine. Every day, she'd bring the treasure she'd earned home and present them to the elderly man over watery tea. Her grandfather would marvel at the shapes and colors of the sweets. A cherry blossom, a chrysanthemum, a peony. They changed, depending on the season. She had no control over this part of her magic. At first, he politely refused the desserts, but she'd insist and then delight in watching him place the candy on his tongue and close his eyes as it melted away. He'd smile and exclaimed it was the best thing he'd ever tasted. Even better than yesterday's and the day after that. Okapa would laugh and relish in the joy of the moment. That alone was enough to sustain her. Embarrassment burned her face and neck. I had a big lunch, her grandfather said, answering the unasked question. He looked down and patted a belly that would never be sated again. This time when he smiled at her, 
It was the most present she'd seen him in years. It's okay, he said. I'm not hungry anymore. He meant it, she thought. All at once, Okapa was knocked sideways as the deranged crowd lunged back and forth. Sarutahiko was so close. Lift, move, hover, stab. Its geta connected with the earth and the earth held the animal up. Another step closer, it stopped. Okapa sat there on the ground, back straight, hands hiding the candy. In front of her, the monkey god, its presence humming inside her head like a field of summer bees, upright in its single-toothed wooden shoes. The two were almost eye to eye. Okapa inhaled and swooned. The scent of it brought back a childhood memory. Deep in the forest, trees shooting straight up where they knitted into latticework and sparkled down gems of sunlight that danced when the wind blew. She knelt in the crackling leaf fall with her grandfather, snapping the fleshy stalks of mushrooms and drinking in the dewy perfume of ferns and cedar and pine. Okapa held out her cupped hands. Her gift wasn't for the stranger Hanshiro, the man bent only on devouring her town and its people. Her gift was for him, the creature held captive. The frenzy escalated. People crawled over one another, groaning with the effort, shrieking in pain. A heel found purchase in another's thigh. A head snapped back when a fist latched onto a handful of hair and pulled it to gain height. On all sides, dozens of gnarled hands thrust toward the animal standing directly in front of Okapa. The townspeople weren't just stroking the creature and the extravagant garments for good luck. They were pinching away tufts of fur from the animal's exposed arms and legs, its tender skin raw and swollen, bleeding. They were consuming him. Did Hanshiro know this? Was this his plan all along? Was the animal a sacrifice? Bile rose in Okapa's throat, her mind twisted. Who were these people? What had they become? She hated them all. This is for you. She pressed the leaf-covered sweetmeat into the animal's paws. The monkey god held up the treasure and examined it. It peeled away the thin leaves until the treat was revealed. A golden chrysanthemum. It looked back at her, and the furious eyes behind the lacquered wood blinked and turned hazel again. An arm shot out to snatch the food. Stop! Ojicham bellowed and the hand withdrew. The grotesque throng swayed and seemed to consider its next move. Okapa looked around and felt the helpless panic of drowning when the realization hit her. The townspeople were no longer separate individuals. They were connected. Limbs conjoined, skin fused. They had become a single raging beast full of fragile bird hearts, all trapped inside heaving rib cages, hungry and insane and greedy for its reward. Why? Was it the horror of their shared memories that turned them? Or was it the absolute futility of their useless lives? Some manic desperation for relief? The fingers continued to pick and pinch at Sarutahiko, who remained still and enduring. Eat it, Okapa urged. The monkey tried to push the fist holding the gold-tinted sugar candy under the tightly tied mask, but it wouldn't reach. Okapa leaned forward and yanked at the cords, releasing the mask. There was no god underneath, only a small animal, its face damp with sweat, fear moving behind its eyes. Okapa stood and threw the carved mask into the crowd opposite where Hanshiro, oblivious, was still chanting and assessing his plunder. The monster crowd moaned and rippled in pleasure. She could feel its hunger increasing. With the disguise removed, the monkey's movements were again quick and twitchy. It blinked up at her. The sugar candy clutched close to his silk-clothed chest. The little thing looked confused, like it had just woken from a dream into a nightmare. Terrified, it wants to flee its fate. 
but we can't, none of us can. Okapa bent over and slipped its tiny feet from the towering shoes and hurled them, too, into the beast. It bucked and undulated. Immediately, the monkey dropped to all fours and scampered across the line scratched into the earth, the line that delineated the profane world along the edges from the holy one in the center. Alone, halfway between the well and the thrashing beast, it sat on the ground rich robes pooling about its body, and stuffed the treat into its mouth. He chewed and stared at Okapa with an emotion she couldn't read. Starving. How long had it been since it had eaten? Lightning crackled through the low black clouds and thunder boomed. The storm was almost on them. The monkey startled at the sound and bolted. It got as far as where the lacquer boxes lay almost to the well, when it was stopped by the rope around its foot. Feeling the pull, Hanchiro looked up. You, he said, what are you doing? He was pointing at Okapa, who was still standing separate among the mass of writhing bodies. His gaze took in the monkey unmasked and small again, and then returned to the girl. How dare you, he roared. Hanshiro threw down the hat that fell heavily but spilled nothing. With both hands, he took up the leash tied to his waist and yanked hard. The monkey's leg was jerked out from under it, and it went sprawling through the dirt, screeching. Okapa cried out, and the beast laughed from its countless cackling maws. Something tugged on her kimono, and she looked down to see her grandfather, so tiny and vulnerable. Was he going to be swallowed up too? Go, Ojichan nodded up at her. It's time. But I'm not hungry anymore. He repeated and smiled. Okapa kicked off the claw-like hands of the neighbors she used to know that were clamping onto her ankles and raced to where the monkey lay crumpled and howling in the pile of red silk. Hanshiro cursed and charged in her direction. He used his walking stick to beat at the creature the crowd had become to clear his path. It'll be okay, Okapa noted the monkey's twisted ankle. The pain of it needled her heart. She felt it too. She touched its forehead and it quieted. She knew what she had to do. Okapa stepped on the rope that bound the god to this world and removed the sickle from her hip. With one swipe, she sliced the tether in half. There, she said, wondering when was the last time the animal had been free. She was about to replace the blade when something hit her hard on the back of the head and stars exploded behind her eyes. She dropped the tool and fell to one knee. More jeering laughter, and this time she recognized the voices. She looked up to see Fuhaku. He was with his five brothers, who were slapping him on the back and congratulating him on his aim. They all weighed a rock in their free hands, and seemed to be debating whose turn it was to throw next. Okapa scooped up the monkey and held it to her chest. She stood up on weak legs, head throbbing. A line of wet trickled from her hairline down her spine. Hanshiro broke through the beast and then stopped. A sudden blast of thunder tore the sky and rain began to spit down, popping the earth. You have no idea what you've done, girl. The stranger began walking toward her again, slower this time. Here, let me help you. He held out one hand, palm open. The other hand gripped the walking stick, cocked behind him, ready to strike. But it wasn't only the man who frightened Okapa. With every step he took in her direction, the beast closed in as well. It was less human than before. Appendages were jointed at unnatural angles and covered in lengths of red pebbled skin, sores full to bursting. Snarled locks of greasy hair grew too fast and snaked like vines, knotting together. Everywhere the mouths constant clacking and sucking of air through foul teeth and gums. The eyes, some angry, some sad, all of them blinking away, sticky tears. 
the beast was growing larger, and because of that, the stage was just as quickly shrinking. There was nowhere to go. The monkey clutched at her work kimono, trembling. It weighed almost nothing in her arms. She held it closer and began backing away. She stumbled through the boxes and the stranger's bags until she bumped against the side of the well. Nowhere to go. Take me with you, she whispered into the animal's ear. We don't belong here. The rain fell harder now, but the shush of it, still not loud enough to drown out the bellowing monster engulfing the makeshift stage. Another rock flew and sliced her cheek. Okapa winced at the pain. Such a pretty, pretty girl, she heard Fuhaku boast to his brothers. He hurled another rock. And so very, very cheap. You can buy her for the price of a stone. You know how this is going to end, Hanshiro said. The man was almost upon her, the sneer on his face confident he had won. His walking stick was gone, and instead he held her sickle with both hands above his head. Okapa climbed the stone wall of the well. Her attention flitted past the stranger and the terrible thing the townspeople had become. There in the moment, right before the beast attacked, right before Hanshiro reached her with his hatred and her blade, she saw her grandfather. The crooked curve of his back and the leaning way he had of walking, her heart lightened. He was making his way in the opposite direction, away from the crowd. He was going back home. When her attention came back to the beast, it was too close. But worse was Hanshiro. He was right upon her, roaring and slashing down with the sickle. Okapa twisted so that the knife missed the monkey at her breast and caught her arm and her side instead. The rip of cloth and her skin cold and stinging underneath. She cried out. Hanshiro raised the weapon again, nowhere to go. Okapa holding the monkey close and whispering in its ear, turned and dove into the well. They fell. The rush of air sweet with the scent of dew and a mossy forest floor. Trees. It felt like it was slowing their descent. The sweet wind whipped at her torn kimono, but the belt sliced through the rough cloth opened and the sleeves released the tufts of crane down she'd collected all these years. The balls of fluff separating and floating around them like a pollen-filled sky. It was growing darker, but not colder, warmer. The monkey chittered and wrapped its arms tighter around Okapa's neck. His silk robes flapped and slipped across her bare skin, silky gossamer licking her stomach around her sides, caressing her back and her legs. She'd never felt anything so soft before. She was finally leaving, she thought. They were leaving. A syrupy poison softened her heart. For the first time since she could remember, she was happy. It was at that moment she realized they weren't falling at all. They were soaring. They were flying. The disk of black well water, rippling silver, turned a bright autumn sky blue, and as they drew nearer, it gained depth, no height. The fragrance of crisp autumn leaves crushed underfoot, the sweet orangey perfume of keen mokusei blossoms filled her lungs. On the edge of the new sky, she saw something stir, something familiar. Her heart softened, too, then burst apart like the thousands of ethereal tufts of crane down dancing in the air around them. Okapa smiled when she recognized what she saw. Each knee. Just before they burst through the sky, she watched a flock of cranes take wing. This time, there were two more than this morning. Fledglings. The end. Thank you for listening, and I will talk to you again in two weeks. Bye-bye. 
You've reached the end of the show, and I just want you to know how much we appreciate you listening and supporting us. Any subscribing, reviewing, and gushing to your friends, family, even random strangers, really does help keep us going. If you have the means and you want to help a little more and get a little more, we are making extra content over on Patreon, all for only $5 a month. Or, if you like to read horror, you might be interested in my Bram Stoker-nominated short story collection, The Carp-Faced Boy and Other Tales. Hontoni arigato gozaimasu. Thank you again, and I'll talk to you real soon.